He was a southern gentleman from the planter aristocracy with a rich background in politics. He'd served in the House of Representatives and the Senate, been governor of Virginia, and was a consummate Washington insider. He believed in states' rights and felt strongly, like Thomas Jefferson, that too much power had been vested in the federal government. And yet, also like Jefferson, he expanded that power once he became president. Number 10, John Tyler, Whig, 1841 to 1845, 51 years old, from Virginia. One of the things that John Tyler is never really given enough credit for, I think, is the way he assumes all of the powers of the office upon Harrison's death. He gives an inaugural address uh, three days after he takes the oath of office and essentially sends a message uh, to members of the Whig Party and to the nation at large that he is in charge. And he proves that in the years that follow. He was a thin man, delicate, blue eyes, he felt that Congress should make policy, and this gave many of the impression of him, him being weak. And this was a great, great misconception. John Tyler of Virginia turned out to be his own man with his own political agenda, which surprised everyone. This became apparent from the get-go when Tyler faced immediate challenges to his newfound authority. He was derisively called his accidency, or his ascendancy. Many believed he was just an acting president until a new election could be called. Even the members of his cabinet, which was really Harrison's cabinet, tried to muzzle Tyler's claim to power. In their first meeting, Secretary of State Daniel Webster told Tyler how the cabinet would make all executive decisions by consensus. To that, Tyler responded by asking for their cooperation or their resignations. For the Whigs, this was devastating. Harrison had promised to push Whig bills through Congress, including a new charter for the Bank of the United States. But Tyler didn't share the Whig view. What happens is really unprecedented, and uh, I don't think it's ever happened uh, since. The Whigs passed two laws authorizing a new national bank, and both of them were vetoed by President Tyler. After the second of these vetoes, the Whigs held a meeting at which they expelled President Tyler from their party. And from then on, Tyler was a man without a party. Politically isolated in the White House, Tyler pressed the business of the nation while imposing his will and skill as president. One of the things that Tyler's not really given credit for is his foreign policy achievements. Uh, you have the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which is really a historic treaty between the United States and Great Britain. This treaty settled the disputed border between the United States and Canada, which was still a British possession. You also have the annexation of Texas, which is very, very controversial. Tyler took it upon himself to sign a treaty with the new Republic of Texas. But the treaty was immediately rejected by the Senate. That didn't stop Tyler. He cleverly asked for a joint resolution of Congress, and that passed. Unfortunately, it didn't improve Tyler's sagging political popularity. I don't really think there was any chance for Tyler to win a second term. He certainly thought about it. I think he wanted it. But the Whigs would have nothing to do with him by 1844, and the Democrats just simply didn't trust him. So he gracefully bows out. It becomes clear that the Democrats have nominated an expansionist like James K. Polk. In the fall of 1844, Americans elected a new president, a dark horse candidate whom nobody anticipated, but everybody embraced because he pledged to finish the work that Andrew Jackson had started.